matters like travel patterns to inform screening and vetting, to inform cooperation with other partners globally, to try to prevent any potential known or suspected terrorists from just entering the hemisphere. Mm -hmm. And that's really where, Margaret, having adequate resources for screening and vetting, both from an information standpoint and from a personal personnel standpoint, becomes incredibly critical. And that's where we hear some of the political talking points about the porousness of the southern border and trying to make a connection to a terror threat. We heard from the border chief here um, 140,000 known gotaways, but he's worried about what wasn't detected. What is needed to fill these blind spots? Well, just to put that number in context, the percentage of gotaways to actual encounters between the Trump administration and the Biden administration is basically equal. But when we think about terrorist travel to the United States, we're talking about travel via air, maritime travel, and of course, land travel. Now, the federal government has the opportunity to position resources overseas to, again, try to prevent terrorists from even getting on a plane or boat here in the first place. But at the border itself, we have to remember that every migrant being encountered is screened and vetted against terrorism and criminal history data sets. But at the same time, vetting is only as good as the underlying information that a migrant's identifiers are being vetted against. And that's where I am concerned that we're under-resourced. We're under-resourced in terms of having the information available to make really informed vetting decisions. With our withdrawals in Afghanistan and Iraq, we have lost certain intelligence capabilities. Because of other intelligence priorities like great power competition with China and Russia, we have seen a resource shift. Mm -hmm. And in light of the expansion of countries of origin showing up at our border, we really need to rethink the kinds of criminal history and terrorism-related arrangements we have with other countries so that the vetting team, not just DHS, DHS alone doesn't conduct vetting, can make the most informed decisions possible based on timely and accurate information. Exactly. A, a finer point on that when you say it's only as good as the information available. Not all of the countries in the world hand over their prison, prison registries to the United <laughs> States government, right? There are certain places we won't know. We won't, and that's where this has to be a mix of the best and most timely intelligence that we can gather, analyze, and integrate exactly. into the vetting architecture in addition <laughs> to these voluntary arrangements that we can uh, agree to with other countries. And are my those hope being is negotiated with like Venezuela, for example. That's the example that we've talked there about. There are Based on my time uh, at DHS and working with the Department of Justice and the Department of State, there is an ongoing discussion about how to enhance our information arrangements with other countries, while concurrently within the intelligence community, conversations about how to make the best use of intelligence collection and analysis resources. But we need a rethink of the international information structure that we have to feed into our vetting architecture. And there is a time limit on how long someone can be detained for under federal law. So how quickly can you do all this vetting? Well, vetting is a point in time check. Vetting is based on the best information you have at that moment. If the federal government had additional resources, the federal government could vet migrants on an ongoing basis. So even after they were released, if new information did enter the system, there would be a recurrent vetting process. And that's where in terms of personnel and technology, mm -hmm. the federal government would benefit from additional vetting resources so that all migrants could be vetted on an ongoing basis. And that would help improve Homeland Security. And the border chief in that interview did ask for more technology and, and more agents. Um, quickly, in terms of what's happening in Texas, the state of Texas doesn't have all the vetting equipment that you're talking about either, do they? The implementation of uh, SB4 would be uh, hugely detrimental from a Homeland Security perspective. The vetting architecture that we use at the federal level, level is incredibly complex and relies on both unclassified and classified data sets. Texas has none of that infrastructure. If Texas detains a migrant, puts them into, puts them into jail, they could be holding a known or suspected terrorist, a transnational organized criminal, without even knowing and without even having the proper security to ensure that there's not a threat mm -hmm. emanating from that individual to the homeland. It would be incredibly catastrophic. Important context. Exactly. Sam, thank you. Thanks. We'll be right back. This is what uh, various people are guilty of here in America, pretending to the White House, Northwest Tennessee, that has purposely wanted to hinder or put Bible prophecy on the back burner that now it has resulted 
in so much, so many areas that, that can be scrutinized or basically, um, um, mishandled in a direction towards li people's lives being in danger. And this is the part the people over in Kenton, Tennessee, pertaining to the Neal family, are, are other people that has initiated this type of, of uh, rebelliousness here in Northwest Tennessee. This is the part that they either don't get, don't understand, or they're incapable of understanding, or they do understand it, and they don't care until it comes to their house, until a gunman gets loose in their school, until somebody gets hurt in their family. Then all of a sudden they become concerned. Then all of a sudden, oh, we, we got we to gotta fight this. We got to fight this. We have been fighting this now for 30 something years. And instead of it getting better, in actuality, it's only gotten worse. It's only gotten worse. And now it's not just the American people's lives that's in danger pertaining to their citizenship, but it's all over the world. All over. It's sad. It's really, really sad that it has taken this type of bitterness before people start to awaken, awaken in understanding well, just exactly where is the core of origin here? Where where did it begin? It began right here in Northwest Tennessee. That's where it began. It began whenever a telephone call was made to the White House about the Antichrist in 1983. That's where it began. It didn't begin over in a faraway land, pretending to the Gentiles. It says in the Bible, until the Gentiles be fulfilled. We got people right here in America that did not want the Gentiles to fulfill their own prophecy. And you can kind of halfway understand that, you know, whenever you get to looking at, at the Muslims or you get to looking at even the Jews towards uh, various groups of people that won't, didn't want the, uh, the Gentiles to be fulfilled, pertaining to their prophecies. But we got people right here in America that was fighting against their own people. Not just myself, but all the true born-again Christians trying to turn right into wrong, wrong into right. Texas, you have a female, an X and a Y, you have a male. And the res this resides in every cell in the human body. Um, every single cell of a woman is female, and every single cell of a man, a man is male. And the National Academy of Sciences affirms that there are multiple ubiquitous differences in the basic cellular biochemistry of males and females. You just can't randomly change it. And this is the big confusion that the evil of today wants to try to uh, impose upon us. Father, before I let you go, we have about a minute left. Why do you think the radical left is pushing so hard for this? It's population control. It's the same thing with abortion. It's the same thing with homosexuality. But what they don't explain to you is a person's sex can't be changed by hormones or modification of genitals. The only way to change one's sex is to genetically modify every somatic cell, which no surgery or drug can do. We have to face the reality. Father Chris Allard, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you on this uh, Palm Sunday. Wow. Was well, that some deep stuff to think about right here on Palm Sunday? I'll never forget Palm Sunday because I was in MCC in downtown Chicago at the time. And all of a sudden a priest come to my jail cell uh, with a telephone in his hand saying that I had a telephone call. And it was my son, Nicholas, that had made arrangements towards talking to me about his grandfather being at the point of death, wanting to know what did he expect for me to expect out of him to do in case it reached that boiling point that he had to make that decision. And I had to explain to him basically the same type of scenario that happened with my brother, that if the only thing that's going to keep Papa alive is a machine, I think Papa would no longer want to be alive. 
the same with myself or any or most anybody else that really don't want to be relied upon some sort of a machine and keeping them alive. But I'll never forget Palm Sunday in MCC in downtown Chicago whenever that occurred. And I'm thinking that was that it was the year 2009 whenever it happened. God bless, God bless America, and good luck to all of us pertaining to all this calamity going on. Shalom on Palm Sunday.